you. Well, we are going to continue this conversation taking a look at resilience. Um, and we actually, one of our, our speakers, as, as it is during UNGA week, got pulled away. But uh, I think Jonathan Pupalitas and I will be able to, to handle this just fine on our own. Um, so I first want to thank Food for the Hungry for being one of our partners today. And Jonathan is Vice President for External Engagement for Food for the Hungry. And we want to have a conversation about really building resilience and finding new ways of doing this, particularly in a world with compounding crises. And you know, Jonathan, I want to start off with really talking about what we mean by resilience. You've written some about this and how often the way that MDBs and other institutions handle it is really more about crisis management rather than true resilience building. So I'd love to hear you kind of as table stakes, what does resilience really look like? Great, thank you so much, Kate. So if we were talking about resilience 10 years ago, we'd be talking about food security, largely. And there's an irony there in the sense that resilience really applies and kind of takes its own when you're looking at complex risks across multiple places, pandemics, epidemics, conflicts, price shocks, extreme urbanization, slumification, and so forth. And so it offers a look at how different crises and risks interact it tells you where there are vulnerabilities within specific populations, infrastructure, systems, institutions, and markets. And it gives you sort of a guiding framework on the kinds of capacities you need to build for resilience that go beyond disaster management, which is sort of uh, response by committee uh, and teams and units to really thinking about the kinds of system reforms one needs to have true resilient uh, systems in health and education and water sanitation where you can really kind of move things forward. Um, the, to give you an example, the, the World Bank has something called their, re, re, their resilience rating system now. And this is a system that's looking at wherever the bank funds climate resilience, they're asking two questions. Is the intervention itself resilient? So if you're trying to build an institution or a system like health, can that system make it through times of crisis and keep functioning. The other question it asks is, are, um, is there a resilience dividend? Are you building resilience in the population, in the institutions, in the markets themselves as well? And so this is a more systemic approach to resilience. We have a new uh, global program model ourselves where we've made resilience central to, to what we're doing in development. And part of the reason of that is looking at the last decade, you kind of see whether it's World Bank evidence or UN evidence or ODI or, or USAID that even in countries that were historically very fragile, the path to long-term growth, the path to sustainable poverty escapes where people don't fall back into poverty the year after they get out of it, and the path to lasting peace really comes by way of resilience, being able to deal with risks and crises in a way where you don't collapse or fall down. And over time, getting to some of those more structural um, political issues about exclusion and marginalization, which is what really drives vulnerability to crisis. Because if you're a population that has no access to services and support, you're much more vulnerable than the kind of in-groups um, that are kind of maybe the political base of a particular place. So in our model, we've rather dedicated ourselves to looking at resilience through kind of a locally led lens, a systems lens, and a kind of politically informed lens looking at those root causes as well. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit about um, taking that a little step further, you know, what that looks like and as other organizations are thinking about integrating this resilience-centered approach to their work, do you have an example of, of practically what that looks like in, in, you know, in action? You know, it, it's, it's a big question and it's a question that shows that even though resilience has been around and we hear it a lot these days, it's still a relatively new field, except in the spaces of climate change. Uh, a little bit, and food security, where it's really taken root. USAID has uh, just produced a policy, a uh, resilience policy, where they're noting that resilience will apply everywhere in the agency, all the sectors where it works, from services to economy, to peace and justice, uh, to stabilization, so right around the board, and it will apply in every country at work, where it works as well. The World Bank is getting there as well, and, and uh, it's too bad Assistant Secretary La, La Tortue couldn't join us because she's really been trailblazing those efforts at, at the bank. 
But I think where it starts in terms of the integration story is shifting mindsets into thinking not just about needs-based approaches, but risk-based approaches, right? We are a very needs-based community. When there's a humanitarian emergency, we do a humanitarian needs assessment. When there's a disaster or a conflict, we do a post-conflict needs assessment, the PCNA process, or a post-disaster needs assessment, the PCDA process. This is the one done by the World Bank and the EU and the UN and so forth. And we define sustainable development as meeting today's needs without compromising the future generation's ability to make their own, meet their own needs. So it's very needs-based. And resilience is really shifting that story to looking at risks, crises, and their root causes. The, um, the World Bank has a risk and resilience assessment. And recently, they've elevated it to a core diagnostic, which means it's one of the major tools that the bank will use to determine complex risks and how the bank supports resilience building. Now, the independent evaluation group at the World Bank took a look at several years of this tool being used and found that there's some good detail around political economy factors in these countries, but there's no uh, link to risks and there's no link to specific types of resilience activities. And this is in the risk and resilience assessment. Right? And then there's a talented team at the bank now working on this issue, but it just goes to show it takes a mindset shift. When you can kind of shift uh, paradigms to say we're focusing on risks, not just needs, then you can start to look at integration. You can say, we want to work in the health sector or the education sector. What does that look like? What are the risks of disruption from epidemics, pandemics, shocks of disaster, uh, demographic pressures? How will the system respond? And in this case as well, it's important to see that the system isn't just the formal health system, for example. It's the informal one as well. It's the communities, it's the families, kind of looking at it more holistically and trying to then map out where are there existing capacities in the formal and informal system to better absorb a shock or a stress? Right? How can you withstand it with better infrastructure, savings groups, insurance products that can help pay, pay out to families uh, in times of crisis or even before sometimes this parametric insurance? There's this need for an adaptive capacity for integration where you're looking at if the way we do education is compromised because of a crisis, how do we have a pivot ability to adapt and keep going after education when we don't have, say, in school? How do we go to remote learning? And you can see the countries that could pivot, that did have that adaptive capacity, were able to continue education. And the ones that couldn't lost literally years during the pandemic, right? In Africa and Latin America and so forth. So that's really key. And then the last capacity that is really talked about in resilience is the transformative capacity. This is the capacity to um, have large scale solutions like safety nets. It's the capacity to have, take a risk and transform it into an innovation that's, uh, that's resilient. So flood zones in Guatemala, uh, where I just was, we had a resilience forum there. Some of them had been turned into hydroelectric dams where the flood no longer exists because the dam process works and now it's generating hydroelectric power. So it's actually turned into a kind of a transformative solution that's aiding resilience. So in terms of integration, you look at a particular system, formal and informal, you look at the kinds of risks and disruptions that are occurring in that system, and then you look at how to build the absorptive, adaptive, and transformative capacities across the system to become more resilient. And for those in our audience, what would you be your advice to them on how they should be thinking about resilience, this mind shift, as you say, and in integrating into their work, no matter what sector or organization they're representing? So, Someone recently came to me from the Philippines and said, we have this amazing uh, education project. It's got mobile technology, uh, it's got learning, it's got RCTs, randomized control groups. It's really gonna make a huge difference. And my response to them was, that's amazing. That's exactly the kinds of things that we're looking for to accelerate education. But did you know that 90% of, of schools in the Philippines are at high risk of, of disasters, multiple disaster hazards? And between 2021 and 2023, two million learners in the, in the school system in the Philippines were disrupted by these disasters. So the question I think always has to be, where, how, are you, how are you solving for the risks and crises that come? You can build the best developmental mousetrap. 
you can have the best technology, you can have the, the sustainability model of we've got the financing, we've got the human resources, we've got the capacity building. But if you aren't solving for risks and crises, then you, you know, you're not ready for, for this age of crisis that we're in. And it's really interesting because sometimes I hear resilience talked about as, yes, this is what we need to meet this moment of poly crises, of converging crises. But as I said a moment ago, it's really the way we've always gotten to where we are. Right? Resilience is always the way. The, the World Development Report uh, for the bank puts out, the, the 2017 version says, everybody thinks that the long-term high growth uh, advanced economies of today got there through big push economics in manufacturing and kind of pulling out the poor through this rapid growth episodes. And a bank report itself says that's really not how it happened. It was those economies that could better manage the violent conflicts, the shocks, the stress, the, the economies ups and downs, the boom and bust cycles, those are the ones that got there, right? And the, uh, the ODI's work with, with, um, with USAID on poverty escapes were asking a very similar question. You know, how is it that almost half the amount of people that, that got out of poverty in Uganda fell back into it? And more than that in Ethiopia, people would escape year after year and then they would fall back into poverty. And they found that it was the shocks and stress that did it. It was, it was not plateauing at a certain area and you just couldn't grow anymore or you, know, you didn't have the productive capacity anymore. It was these either idiosyncratic shocks at the household level or these big covariate shocks that were throwing people back. And the more you can invest in resilience as you grew, the more you could get out of that state. And this is where we see Bangladesh as this sort of paradox where it's dealing with a lot of political fragility and risks it spent so much time investing in more economic uh, and environmental resilience, including for women, that it really has been able to show a lot of resilience, surprisingly. Yeah. Right. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much. And thank you, Fikrita, and great for being a partner with us today. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone.